afternoon. Welcome to an exchange from India talk uh, with leaders of the industry, captains of the industry, people who run large organizations, have a huge impact. Today on this show, we have Ms. Zareen Daruwala, who's the CEO of Standard Chartered uh, Banking Group in India. Welcome, Ms. Daruwala, to this conversation, and thank you for making time. How have you been doing? Uh, what's keeping you busy in COVID times? And tell us uh, how's been the journey in the last 55 days as an individual, as a leader, and uh, for the organization that you lead to at the end. Yeah, so actually, um, I have really not stepped out of home, literally out of my uh, complex in the last 55 days. But uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a revelation uh, for me personally. I never thought as a bank we could operate with 90% plus people working from home. And um, uh, given the, the fact that banks are really tech savvy, it has really enabled us to ensure that most of our employees have laptops at home and they are enabled to work. Um, we have obviously over time taken a lot of calls locally as to how we'll uh, you know, service customers. For example, customers also are not sometimes able to send mails from their official IDs. They are sending requests for transactions through personal IDs. So we reinvented our processes to ensure that customers really, uh, all the transactions are something that we can seamlessly uh, fulfill. In fact, um, uh, the lockdown happened on 25th March and you know, with year end for customers, salary payments, uh, the period between March 25th and March 31st was really something that uh, high volume of transactions and sudden uh, change of how we were operating. But uh, as a bank, uh, given the fact that we knew our colleagues in China and Hong Kong and Singapore had started, and even Philippines, had started uh, the quarantine process. So we had a bit of heads up. So we had actually started moving to maybe 50% uh, work from home uh, before the entire lockdown. And uh, to that extent, there was a bit of preparedness. There was a bit of planning. Uh, so we had the benefit of that. You had a head start on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talked about how you had become more tech-enabled. You were always were, but the digital engagement with customers is in increased, enhanced. Uh, tell us, how has the relationship with your banking customers changed, if at all it has changed, and if at all it's changed for the better? So give us some insights into how do you see uh, the new banking relationship with the customer with l almost zero the people coming into the bank branch. You you invested in a huge branch system, ATM system, but it's all become you know digitally enabled. So tell us how's the relationship of a banker in a bank changing with the customers. So clearly, um, uh, the last few uh, last two three months has ensured that we we were fairly well uh, penetrated digitally. We have about seventy percent of our customers who are digitally active. But uh, on the corporate side, we've actually reached 99% plus. Uh, and last uh, few weeks has, in fact, accelerated because customers had no choice but to use our digital uh, internet banking and uh, use all the digital infrastructure that the bank operates. Uh, also, we've ensured that a lot of the service requests we are able to fulfill digitally through a self-service mode. The customer really doesn't need to call the call center. And I think uh, the technology, one thing that was in fact um, something that we enabled very quickly after the lockdown was the call center. Where employees could take calls sitting in, at their home and even do the recording which is required um, statutorily. So that was something to my mind that was really technologically quite difficult but our teams did it very quickly within a day or two of the lockdown so we were able to service our customers having said that clearly customer volumes on call center was something that was far higher uh, while branch footfall obviously came down to a trickle so a lot of the traffic got diverted uh, to the call center to that extent for first one week it took a while to adjust but now we are, uh, we are servicing customers uh, last seven weeks sitting at home. So how do you see banking is a little bit about empathy also. So how do you bring empathy in 
in digital transactions, you know, in that change relationship. So uh, empathy comes in uh, only if a customer actually has face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, contact. But uh, I think uh, what banks are doing, and this is not right now, but last few months or one year, is something that banks are working on, which is hyper-personalization uh, using AI and machine learning. So uh, through hyper-personalization, if a customer is used to sort of shopping from a particular store and is near that store, uh, you know, a message will go, oh, we have this offer on cards, uh, credit cards, and would you like to take it? So that hyper-personalization, which Amazon does beautifully, uh, we see in China, Alibaba, Alipay do it. I think in banking, increasingly, it will work on hyper-personalization because you really can't uh, have too much of physical uh, contact with the customer till this COVID dies down. So that is where I think the customer sensitivity, not bombarding a customer with unwanted SMSs and unwanted messages, but sending something which we believe as a customer, the customer wants. Fantastic. I think uh, you give fantastic examples of how a bank uh, is dealing with this new paradigm and utilizing technology to serve the needs of the customer. I also want to ask you, have you been watching news? Uh, you know, as, oh, you know yes. the news viewership has grown by this session is presented by ABP News. The new news viewership has grown up from hundred percent to two hundred percent. In some cases, two fifty percent, three hundred percent, and across languages, English, Hindi, and the Indian languages. So, what's your view on news channels? Uh, and have you been watching a lot of news channels? Not a lot. I prefer, I'm still the traditional print media person, so I read my newspapers a lot on the e-newspapers. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think uh, given the fact that people, uh, you know, are the only way of coming, sort of absorbing news is through, you know, news channel, because that's the most much more authentic than social media kind of news. So I would like to believe that in this period, people would and there's a bit of anxiety level. There's a bit of, you know, what next kind of thing. So people would be watching much more of the news. And the fact that some people do have time. Not all. Not, not everybody has time because people are double hatting domestic uh, work and uh, official work right now. Fantastic. Uh, you know, you're, you're in the thick of the economy. Banking and financial services are the backbone of any economy. Yesterday, the finance minister and day before yesterday, the prime minister announced this relief package. Uh, and we know that there's been a negative impact in the last 60 days on the Indian economy and the global economy. Uh, what are your comments on the economy and this package from the finance minister? So I'll start with the economy. I think we've seen uh, quite a bit of sharp drop. Uh, in fact, uh, our internal house view is the GDP will be uh, minus 2% for this year. Uh, we saw March, interestingly, March, despite uh, the lockdown was actually last seven days, but March itself, the IIP has dropped quite substantially. And April to June, uh, GDP uh, will go down by 22%. Uh, that's right. a uh, number if you look at uh, our uh, nominal GDP of 203 lakh crores, 22% uh, drop will be close to 10 lakh crores in the April to June uh, quarter itself. So that's a massive uh, thing. The second thing is the red zones uh, account for 52% of the GDP. So that clearly is hurting the uh, industrial production and the services sector. And if you look at our lockdown, India, I had seen an article of Economist where India is, if one was to take one to 100 on the stringent, stringency uh, uh, of the lockdown, India is 100 uh, on a scale of one to 100. So it was the most severe lockdown that was there. And if you look at the PMI readings, uh, March was 49.3, April was 5.4. So clearly, uh, we really need to look at how we can now kickstart the economy very quickly. Uh, of course, the silver lining was that the oil prices came down 
and um, uh, every one dollar of oil reduction per barrel is about one and a half billion dollar of GDP save uh, of fiscal deficit uh, reduction. So to that extent, I think India has been a little bit cushioned. About one percent of the GDP uh, uh, will get saved uh, through because India imports a lot of oil and um, 1.4 billion barrels. So we will get about uh, you know, if we look at even $25 save, we have uh, at least $30 billion kind of savings uh, due to oil imports. Fantastic. And, you know, as you rightly said, and as the finance minister and the prime minister, the MSMEs are really the backbone. And Standard Chartered Bank has been a, you know, apart from being a large lender and consumer banking, MSMEs also form a part of your portfolio. Tell us, uh, how are you reimagining lending to MSMEs? So what we uh, took a view internally is that uh, the traditional method of bank assessment or working capital will not work because uh, there'll be no drawing power or very little drawing power. So what we decided is we looked at a cash flow based approach uh, for assessing what is the cash flow shortfall. And to that extent, we support our clients. Uh, yesterday's announcement is really, really good because uh, it achieves many things because it doesn't put a huge fiscal load on the government in this year, but it ensures that the flow of credit to MSMEs uh, sort of uh, gets accelerated. So if you look at uh, the uh, proposal of 3 lakh crores, there's a one-year moratorium. So thankfully, you know, the government's fiscal uh, for this year will not get strained. And also one doesn't expect that, you know, the entire three lakh crore is going to go wrong or bad. So to that extent, the government has achieved many purposes through this measure. And uh, I think that will really help because MSMEs uh, contribute to about 30% of the GDP and 50% of exports. 12 crore people are associated with MSMEs, so it has a very high impact on the economy. The um, other good measure I feel was the 20,000 crore subordinate debt. So even if an MSME is struggling, actually um, it's a very um, uh, good thing to support because uh, rather than uh, make them NPAs, it's good to step in and support them in this period. Also. Right. The equity uh, flow that has been announced, the fund, that also gives, because for banks, uh, you know, you can't give, you need a certain debt equity ratio. And that right. fund also will ensure that uh, the um, uh, MSMEs get the equity that is needed. So I think uh, very good measures for MSME sector. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for being op optimistic because optimism is a trait that leaders have. While they're realistic about what they, what's happening, most leaders believe that future will be better than today. As a leader, you're the CEO of this large organization. Um, what is your leadership style? And what do you tell yourself so that you can keep yourself calm and prepared for what's happening? So my leadership style is... Um... I'm very decisive, uh, so I take decisions. Uh, and um, other thing is, um, I actually, um, I do a bit of planning, like I had mentioned earlier, you know, we were anticipating this kind of lockdown, not as severe as we saw it, but we were definitely expecting a lockdown kind of situation. Uh, and we planned for it. So I think as leaders, one, you need to be able to plan. Obviously you don't get it right, 100%, but at least if you get it right to a large extent. You build scenarios A, B, C. Yeah. And uh, clearly uh, uh, that helps in times like this. The second is uh, the decision. I take uh, quick decisions. And the third is I have a can-do attitude. So for me, everything can be done. Uh, there's nothing that is impossible. And that's the spirit with which I uh, sort of operate. Fantastic. You know, when Zareen talks to all the colleagues, what do you tell them? What's your favorite line? Or, you know, some of the mantras that you give them to be able to transfer your leadership to them, to be able to give them positivity 
a lot of people are frustrated and anxious. This is literally the VUCA world. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. What do you tell your colleagues to be able to equip them uh, to deal with what's happening now or in the future better? So in the lockdown period, I did a big call with all my employees. And one of the things I focused on was how well the bank performed in Jan to March. Beautiful. There was Focus no on the positives. Yeah, and there was no reason for us not to continue the good momentum. Albert, yeah, April and May might be a little subdued, but the good momentum should not sort of, uh, sort of, the present thing should not wipe out the good work that was done. Right. Second uh, issue is about, uh, uh, you know, how do you, how do you quickly move to resolve uh, if you feel that clients are going to be stressed, you, you bucket them into clients who are genuine, who need a bit of helping hand, and then clients who, who you feel you know are much more uh, deep-rooted problem. And then you have different solutions for different sets of clients. So this is something that we really um, focused on. Um, and we have a plan as to how we are going to handle different sets of clients, uh, depending on the industry that they belong to. And depending on how severe the, the coronavirus impact will be. Okay, beautiful. Being, you know, we are getting, you know, one of the beauty about this digital transformation and the digital enablement that we become part of our life. We are talking through a webinar, you're in your home, I'm in my home, my colleagues who are enabling it are in their home, the audiences are in their home. Just the questions, the interactivity. So I want to bring viewers here. Uh, so what, uh, there is Tanvir Daswani asking, what will the banks be doing on physical retail branches and all corporate offices for the next 12 months? What will you do there underutilized? Soumya Deep Ghosh is asking, if consumers haven't enough money to buy products or cash flows, uh, you know, they don't have enough money, how will the MSME return the loan? So you're giving the loans, but the businesses are not still getting demand. Um, what do you have to say about that? And then more questions. Yeah. So the, for the first question, anyway, I think we leave the branches and the offices because the of physical distance norms will ensure that you know, uh, fifty percent max, fifty percent colleagues can come to office till the virus dies down because we need to have that minimum few, few meters distance. So we will need all the physical premises for sure, and even in the branches. Customers need, uh, between two customers, you need to keep the So we will need all the infrastructure for sure. Uh, we don't see ourselves uh, doing anything differently uh, for the next one year. Uh, in terms of uh, how many employees should be working from home and how many from office, I think it's a function of criticality of the role and also the personal side if us, uh, our employees have some, you know, old elderly parents or small children, then we look at that as, you know, people who will work for home for some time and the remaining coming to office. So I think the physical infrastructure is here to stay. In terms of the MSME, the buying part, I, I think clearly uh, the challenge for the government will be how to revive demand because even if, as you address the production side issues, the challenge will be how do you revive demand because of jo uh, your job insecurity, uh, because of what people have seen. Uh, there's a bit of uh, conservatism which has come and a lot, I mean, the kind of savings we are seeing in the banking system is huge because customers flights to safety is already happening. And we're seeing that uh, even the future funds are having huge redemption pressure and Good banks, uh, uh, you know, are uh, strong banks, uh, rather, are getting a lot of flow of deposits. And they've been obviously a big beneficiary of that also. So uh, on the demand side, uh, you know, there are a few things that I've seen other countries do. For example, Germany, post-financial uh, crisis, actually had a scrappage policy uh, to revive the auto industry, which is a big industry in Germany. And even in India, auto industries fairly significant, both yeah, from a financing side and also from a job creation side because yeah. manufacturing leads to big number of jobs. So in Germany, what they did was for every car, the German government gave 2,500 euro 
uh, uh, benefit to the customer. And in one year, the auto demand jumped by 40%. Now, those are the kind of interventions that will be needed. For example, recently, we've seen Korea, for example, has set up a $33 billion fund to support industries which they think have got very badly impacted, like, uh, you know, uh, shipyards and uh, airlines and, uh, you know, the, it's the usual sectors which are tourism related, etc. Now, different governments are doing different things to sort of support certain sectors. And, uh, uh, you know, even if, if, even if you have like a four month window saying that right. oh, I'm going to reduce uh, the GST uh, for three months or four months and, you know, it's a special period. You can just quickly kickstart some of that purchasing uh, happening. Similarly, in real estate, you we don't see people right now wanting to buy any real estate. So if the government can bring down the stamp duty for a finite period and uh, and reduce the ready reckoner rates, that can spur the uh, home uh, home purchase. So you will need to also do sharp interventions on the demand side to spur demand. Because Indian consumers are very value-seeking consumer, and moment you they see value, even if it's for four or five months, they will rush in in that period. And after that, you know the the momentum continues as what we've seen. Beautiful. I think we get, you know we've got ten questions. So the reason I'm looking at my screen is that I'm looking at the questions, and you know uh, questions are a good indicator of that people are very engaged in their. So thank you for being specific and giving suggestions that are implementable. So I want to compliment you on for doing that. And you know, there's some questions that we would, can take them now. What is the biggest lesson that the banking sector has learned from COVID-19? And what do you feel should be the action should be, that should be implemented? Prachi Chandiram Ramani. Are the bankers trained to protect themselves from the COVID-19 as they will be dealing with huge crowds as part of money dispensation in the near future? Uh, AGV Narayan, do you feel self-reliance by local will affect your business post-COVID because you are a stand chart? I think that. Dr. Parag Amin, small businesses were worst hit as they do not even have enough reserves to take care of their fixed costs like rent salaries. Banks too are not very forthcoming in terms of helping them. What is your comment on this? Uh, Tanvir Daswani, would you be renegotiating rents on your physical branches? And then more questions with, you know, so you're a standard chartered bank, though you must tell uh, viewers how long you've been in India. I know that so you're pretty much an Indian bank, uh, you know, uh, you've been here. So why don't you take them through the journey of Stan Chart just to refresh uh, the history of Stan Chart in India? So Stan Chart has been in India for 160 years. So That's right. Uh, okay. I want to tell to all the viewers, 160 years. Because in my first job I in 96, I used to deal with Stan Chart and I did learn that it was there for so many years. So it was it was mind boggling to know that. So it's, it's been around for 160 years in India. I want to emphasize to the person who asked the question. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, Dr. Parag Amin's question, uh, banks are not forthcoming in helping them. I think yesterday's announcement by the FM clearly will ensure that uh, small businesses certainly get credit. Uh, and uh, 3 lakh crores is a very large number because this is over and above. This is the incremental need that will be catered. Uh, I think uh, there was a bit of nervousness amongst banks because of the uncertainty of the period of lockdown. As also, you know, if there, the, some banks do have their fair share of NPAs and they were worried about lending further and having much more NPAs. So I think yesterday's measure, to my mind, addresses at least the MSME sectors. I'm sure phase two will address certain other industries which have been badly affected. Uh, do, uh, the other question, Mr. Narayan, do you feel self-reliance will affect your business post-COVID? No, I don't think so. Uh, we are a very strong local bank. Of course, we do a lot of cross-border trade, but uh, I don't think that will affect our business. So, you know, uh, we have... A, I would say about 80, 90% of our revenues just from local, local business and a little bit from cross-border business. How do you review the economic package announced yesterday by FM? 
I would say uh, for the MSME sector, it's really good. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, the kind of uh, you know banking uh, flow that will go to the sector will, my view, reinvigorate the sector. And given the kind of employment that this sector caters to, it's a very very needed uh, uh, package. Uh, we've seen a lot of other countries also support SMEs. For example, Singapore government has given a nine month moratorium. On, uh, and a lot of uh, Indonesia, many countries have supported SMEs in a big way, given the employment that they give. Uh, are the bankers trained to protect themselves from the COVID-19 uh, as they'll be dealing with huge crowds? Uh, actually, uh, interestingly, the footfall is quite low and people are quite scared. So, you know, it, uh, people will try and avoid coming to branches as much as possible and use digital channels. UPI, for example, is something that loads of clients are using. Uh, in March, UPI had 52 uh, uh, cro uh, crores of uh, transactions. So, you know, that's the kind of volume UPI is having. So, uh, we are seeing clients increasingly use as much digital. So, and then they'll use the ATMs. Uh, clearly, there is a protocol that banks are already following inside the branches. We do temperature check when a customer walks into a branch. We keep sanitizers. We have uh, the screens uh, so that our employees are not directly exposed to the customer. So there are many precautions banks are already taking. Uh, biggest lesson banking sector has learned from COVID. Um, I think the biggest lesson we've learned is that we can run the bank with 90% sitting at home, which to me, two months back, if somebody had said, I would have been very, not very sure, I would say, but today I can be very sure that we can deliver to customers almost similar levels of services with uh, so many people sitting at home. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things is I tell myself, never say never. Have an open mind. We don't even know what we don't know, you know. I would say the same. I would be very skeptical who said to me that all the media operations can run from home. I, I'd say it's not possible. But time has shown us that it is possible. Uh, so if I may ask a question that's not there and some of it answers all the questions, you know, it kind of, see, I'll cover on Monday that hits the 3C economy. Caring, collaborative, and contact lens. Uh, tell us, how do you reimagine your bank in a caring, collaborative, and contactless economy? So, uh, contactless is something that anyway banks are quite used to because uh, a lot of customers and a lot of volumes of transactions are actually happening uh, uh, contactless. I think caring is uh, about uh, what the bank has done in the last few weeks, for example, old people, our people have actually gone and delivered cash to their house uh, where couples could not come out. Or uh, old people, in fact, to the extent that some of them have even helped them with their grocery and things like that. So I think that little personal touch for people who are not as privileged in terms of their ability, their handicapped or whatever, I think that is where... Um, the bank uh, clearly uh, has, uh, there have been really nice emails that I'm getting from customers. Normally you have a lot of customer complaints, but off late I'm getting a lot of thank you mails. So that shows that the bank has become really more caring in the new, uh, this thing. The third C, sorry, you mentioned was what? Uh, collaborative. Caring, caring, collaborative, collaborative. contactless. Yeah. So collaborative, I think, to my mind, uh, the bank has to be collaborative with the customer and have empathy for what the customer is going through, the business uh, problems, and give a solution and have a solution approach uh, to a customer. Fantastic. So you are, so some of the ideas that you may have implemented in this lockdown may have come from suggestions uh, from the customers, you know, could have or in future could come, if, you know, in terms of how uh, the processes work. Uh, there are more questions. I want to bring in a senior editor that we have, Mr. Ruhel Amin, and Ruhel wants to ask a question. Can we have Ruhel on the screen? Ruhel wants to know is, how will the marketing spends of Standard Chartered Bank uh, change 
post uh, covid or already have the change so uh, you know it's a big brand but staying top of mind you know investing in getting new banking customers so tell us a little bit about the marketing mix mix how it is changing and what will change and what will stay so i think uh, clearly the marketing spends will increase on digital marketing because face to face contact with customer will be minimal for the next one year or till the covid dies down so uh, the whole uh, marketing spends will be much more digital uh, and less uh, on the you know the tv and that kind of uh, spends for a bank for a bank like us which is uh, because the good thing about digital uh, marketing is after that the fulfillment is also end to end digital so for the customer the journey is seamless from the time he shows an interest suppose in a credit card or a personal loan the whole fulfillment can be end to end digital for a customer hmm. so one of the things is that not in your you know stand chart as you said the numbers are very healthy but you know and i'm not asking about any so the the, the npas in banks have grown right by and large of course there are exceptions and with covid coming in will there be job losses in the banking sector in the financial services sector do you see an or where where banks will kind of shrink in the number of people they work with at least i do think so right now i don't see that happening unless uh, it becomes really uh, dismal uh, even one or two years later because uh, the, the thing is that as as uh, what we've done in our bank for example is as we've gone digital we've actually retrained uh, certain job families and reskilled them and deployed them elsewhere and uh, to me uh, leaders uh, banking leaders actually have to focus on reskilling employees because every time you introduce some technology the whole the way you do the your processes your uh, everything has to change and uh, leadership you know involves like ensuring that the employees are continuously upgraded and the skills are upgraded and uh, in fact we are using this lockdown period uh, to ensure our customer uh, clients uh, sorry our employees do e learning and they do a lot of um, Uh, sort of self skilling uh, and use this period very judiciously right fantastic uh, there are more questions and let me take audience questions rather than putting my question uh, you know somebody asked would you be renegotiating rents on physical premises no uh, we have not renegotiated any rents okay uh, if you had to make a prediction for the future what would that be I think it's very hard to make a prediction. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't think I'm equipped to make prediction. But uh, the way I have planned uh, is that nine or twelve months. Clearly, uh, COVID is here to stay. And given that scenario, how should we be planning our bank and our employees and our operations? So that is the way I'm looking at uh, internally. But hard to say how. you know it's quite possible that even if the vaccine is found by the time you you get the whole immunity for most of uh, majority of the people it's going to be maybe another one year so you know it's quite possible that this whole uh, period can be extended so i think one has to to my mind prepare for the worst in terms of this being an extended period and how do we plan our lives uh, accordingly that's the way we are now also you know rohel amin is again asking he is our editor on experiential marketing he says banks and do a lot of events and activations for customer engagement how are you planning the reach out in a socially distanced world so uh, we have been using uh, webinars uh, already in this lockdown period so for example for our wealth customers we are arranging uh, webinars by calling experts and the attendance is really good and uh, i think this is how we'll have to for some time uh, keep on and obviously uh, emails but more than emails we found the response to we've done about five webinars uh, in the last few weeks for our customers and there's been great response and that is how i think we'll be 
doing it for the next few months to avoid as much physical contact with customers. Perfect. Rohit, you have your answer. I want to ask my two last questions. I know the conversation is still quarter past one. Um, and if there are more questions, we already have had 19 questions and we tried to compress them. One question is, you know, a lot of leaders that I've talked to over the last four weeks, uh, they say that COVID is not necessarily a black swan event. It's a gray rhino event. A gray rhino appears more often than a black swan. So tell us, has the behavior change that you see in your opinion has become permanent or we will go back to our old ways? So what is reversible and what is irreversible? And how does it impact uh, banking? And how does it impact brand building? So I think what is irreversible is the whole digital behavior once customers uh, become uh, digitally savvy. We've not seen them go back to their physical ways. So to my mind, that is an irreversible thing. Uh, what will reverse is definitely customers going back to malls and cinema halls and uh, doing leisure travel. That, that will come back uh, for sure, uh, post the virus having died down. But certain... You believe that? I was talking to an investor. We had a BW Disrupt, which is our uh, startup. We had Rohit Biana, Loomis partner. He says, I won't invest in travel. I won't invest in uh, um, restaurants. I won't invest in hospitality as a sector. I will invest in healthcare at home. I'll invest in elderly care. I'll invest in tracing companies. So that, that is for the next one or two years. Do we see that not coming back at all? I don't think so. I think it will come back. Uh, maybe one and a half years later or whatever, but it will come back. But what we've seen is, uh, uh, you know, the digital behavior of customers, once you're used to buying things online and once you're used to doing your net banking at home or from the convenience of your mobile on the move, you don't change that very often. That's That's been our own experience. So some behaviors will be irreversible. If you look at Alibaba, Actually, Alibaba thrived uh, post uh, the crisis. Uh, the whole e uh, online e-commerce in China actually, when crisis comes, is when certain uh, behaviors change. Exactly. So, what you're clearly saying that uh, in the short term, some of the behavior like more digital discovery, engagement, digital fulfillment will become a way of life, but possibly it'll be a hybrid model. My last question is. Over the last six weeks, eight weeks, we've seen some of the industries become zero revenue. We talked about which one, you know which one. What do you have to say to entrepreneurs, while you may be the CEO of a large bank, the very entrepreneurial if you're a CEO, the very intrapreneurial, what do you have to say to entrepreneurs whose businesses have been brought to ground, you know, they are not getting any revenues, how do they reimagine themselves? How do they go into the future? Actually, I think it's very industry specific how uh, uh, they have to reinvent themselves. So I was uh, interestingly talking to the CEO of a cinema uh, a chain, a multiplexes chain. And um, I was quite uh, impressed with the way, you know, uh, they have thought through that post uh, opening how are they going to do things differently in terms of how will how will uh, us, uh, you know the movie goers sit for how will uh, you know uh, things happen how will you have minimal uh, physical touch whether it's security checking so uh, i think uh, um, pro uh, promoters have to reinvent their, their whole thinking to make the customer feel that even if they go for a movie or whatever they wherever they go they are not likely to contract the virus. I think that mindset shift, if the promoter is able to do, then there's hope of kind of getting the business momentum, obviously not to the same level as pre-COVID, but at least to a large extent to survive. Thank you so much uh, for being real. You know, one of the things I liked about your conversation, you've been specific and real, and of course, optimistic about the future. I want to end by, we still have four minutes. I want to end by asking who are people you look up to? How does Zareen get her inspiration? You know, how, how do you keep yourself centered? Who are the people you look up to? How do you fill yourself with 
the right tools, whether it's emotional tool, it's knowledge tool, the technology tools in this really very changing world full of flux, a very dynamic, you know, you want to learn something new on the go. I was not familiar with Zoom calls. I think it's a way of life like what's happening for me, you know, as easy as. So tell us what, who are the people Zareen Daruwala looks up to and why and how does she keep herself going? How does she reinvent herself? So I have, uh, over the last few years, uh, really, I find, uh, I learn a lot from my customers. And when I say customers, it's not only retail, it's a lot of corporate clients and the CEOs. And I make it a point to stay engaged because I find it very refreshing, uh, even in this period. I, every day I speak to two, three clients just to understand how are things on the ground? What are they doing differently? And sometimes how... Some of the clients are handling, you know, the tough uh, decisions also helps me think through uh, or sort of gives me a lot of insights as to how others are dealing with the situation and how I should be dealing with the situation. The second thing is I, I have a simple attitude. If I don't understand something, I just tell somebody in my office, please explain me. I don't understand it. I have no problems telling I don't understand to anybody. And I think that ensures that one, you are not too full on yourself or, or you think you know it all. Day you think you know it all is the day of your downside because you know you can't know it all. And uh, the, the sooner you acknowledge you don't know it and you, you try and listen to bright minds. Uh, you Domain experts, specialists. Domain experts. You learn a lot. So that's how I, I need uh, my, my own self. And what is your favorite line? Something that you repeat to yourself or you tell your colleagues. Like I tell everyone that, you know, storms don't last, dreams don't perish. I keep telling everyone, your life is about trade-offs. Either you can, you know, eat more or you can be healthy. You know, either you can be meticulous or you can be not successful in what you want. So what is it that Zareen says to herself and to her colleagues? You know, what's your favorite line or, you know, a saying... Never say die attitude. Uh, Never say die. So on this note, uh, we'd like to keep our time. Uh, we're in the business of time. Every minute, every second costs. So thank you, Zareen Darwala, for being so positive, real, and authentic on this conversation. We wish Standard Chart Bank luck. We wish Standard Chart customers luck. And Standard Chart is pretty much an you know, Indian institution, 160 years in India. So we look forward to uh, collaborating with Standard Chartered Bank uh, and in some way enhancing what Standard Chart does. Thank you for joining the Exchange for Media Pitch Talk and we look forward to another conversation another time. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good day.